ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ರಾಜ್ಯ ವಕೀಲರ ಪರಿಷತ್ತು ಕೆ ಎಸ್ ಬಿ ಸಿ ಲಾ ಅಕಾಡೆಮಿ ಮತ್ತು ವಕೀಲರ ಸಂಘ ತಿಪಟೂರು ಇವರು ನಡೆಸಿಕೊಡುತ್ತಿರುವ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮಕ್ಕೆ ತಮಗೆಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ಸುಸ್ವಾಗತ ಇಂದಿನ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸ ನೀಡಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಶ್ರೀ ಎಸ್ ಆರ್ ಸೂರ್ಯನಾರಾಯಣ ರಾವ್ ಹಿರಿಯ ವಕೀಲರು ಚಿಕ್ಕಬಳ್ಳಾಪುರ ಇವರು ಆಗಮಿಸಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇವರಿಗೆ ವಕೀಲ ವೃಂದದ ಪರವಾಗಿ ಸ್ವಾಗತ ಬಯಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೇನೆ ಇಂದಿನ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸದ ವಿಷಯ ಹಿಂದೂ ಕಾನೂನ ಅಡಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ವಿಭಜನೆ ಈ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ವಕೀಲ ಬಾಂಧವರಿಗೆ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸ ನೀಡಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಶ್ರೀ ಸೂರ್ಯನಾರಾಯಣ ರಾವ್ ಅವ್ರನ್ನ ಕೇಳ್ಕೊಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ ಸರ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಕಮೆಂಟ್ ಸರ್ ರೆಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಫ್ರೆಂಡ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಸಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಟುಡೇ ಸ್ಟಾಕ್ ಈಸ್ ಪಾರ್ಟಿಷನ್ ಅಂಡರ್ ಹಿಂಡೂ ಲಾ ವೆನ್ ಎವರ್ ವಿ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಆಫ್ ಎ ಪಾರ್ಟಿಷನ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಆಲ್ವೇಸ್ ಅಸ್ಯೂಮ್ ದೇ ದೇರ್ ಈಸ್ ಸಮಥಿಂಗ್ ಜಾಯಿಂಟ್ ವೆನ್ ದೇರ್ ಈಸ್ ಸಮಥಿಂಗ್ ಜಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ ಆಫ್ ಪಾರ್ಟಿಷನ್ ವುಡ್ ಅರೈಸ್ ಅದರ್ವೈಸ್ question of partition does not arise under hindu law we know what a joint family is a joint family generally owns joint family properties these properties are either acquired from the ancestors or the properties are acquired with the funds or income belonging to the joint family so therefore the members of a joint family have a right by birth in joint family properties these are basics of hindu law in order to understand the concept of partition under hindu law two things will have got to be clearly kept in mind first is a partition consists of two stages one is division of status and later partition by meets and bounds what is a division of status when does a division of status actually take place suppose a person wants to dissociate himself from the joint family and therefore wants his share to be separated and delivered to him at a partition so therefore a, man, a person who wants to walk out of the family can express his intention to separate himself from the joint family when an intention is expressed to separate himself from the joint family the person who expresses this intention he goes out of the joint family immediately after he expresses his intention but there is one rider for this this intention has got to be communicated to all persons who are entitled to a share in the family and the the division of status would be complete when the last member of the family is informed of this intention to separate and the this intention to separate can be done in various ways it could be expressed orally by making a request for partition of a share it could be done by issue of a notice it could also be done by filing up a suit these are the three modes by which a, a division of status can be brought into uh, force in that the question of division of status has been uh, very nicely uh, analyzed by justice k subarao in a decision reported in air 1964 supreme court 136 allagadda raghavamma versus allagadda chenchamma in fact this decision lays down a number of principles relating to hindu law and one of the principles stated in this case is with regard to 
the division of status. This is what is stated in paragraph 24 and onwards in the judgment. It is settled law that a member of a joint family can bring about his separation in status by a, def by a definite, this is what is important, by a definite and unequivocal declaration of his intention to separate himself from the family and enjoy his share in severality. So this is what is important. A definite and unequivocal declaration should be there. Then one cannot declare or manifest his mental state in vacuum. To declare is to make known, to assert to others, must necessarily be those affected by the said declaration. Therefore, a member of a joint family seeking to separate himself from others will have to make known his intention to the other members of the family from whom he seeks to separate. So therefore, this is what is important. Then the next question is, by this declaration, whether the entire family gets uh, separated or the man who expresses the intention alone gets separated is another important factor which has got to be kept in mind. The entire joint family does not get separated by a single co-personer expressing an unequivocal intention to separate. It only separates him from the joint family. The rest of the family continues joint unless they also want their shares to be separated uh, from the, uh, in the joint family. This is what is clearly stated in paragraph 34 of the judgment. It is therefore open to this court to evolve a reasonable and equitable solution without doing violation to the principles of Hindu law. The doctrine of relation back has already been recognized by Hindu law as developed by courts and applied in that branch of law pertaining for adoption. There are two ingredients uh, of the declaration of a member, member's intention to separate. One is the expression of the intention and the other is bringing that expression to the knowledge of the person or persons affected. When once that knowledge is brought home that depends upon the facts of each case, it relates back to the day when the intention is formed and expressed. When the intention is formed and expressed. Between the two intentions, uh, the, uh, but between the two dates, the person expressing the intention may lose his interest in the family property. He may withdraw his intention to divide. He may die before his intention to divide is conveyed to other members of the family with the, uh, with the result, his intention survives to the other members of the family. So therefore, the suppose, a man expresses his intention to divide and it is communicated not to all persons, but a few persons. But in the, if in the meanwhile he dies, then the, the, there, is the, there would be no division of status at all. So after all the members are informed of his intention, then the division of status relates back to the date on which he first expressed his intention. This is what is important. Suppose between the date of expression of the intention and the date when it is communicated to the last member of the family, suppose some per properties are sold to the, uh, for purpose of necessities of the family that would bind the person who expresses that intention also. And it may be that during that period, it would even happen that somebody may die, some, some person may be born. So therefore, on the date 
when the expression when the intention is expressed whatever properties are available only in respect of those properties the person who wants to separate a, a himself from the family will get a share so therefore this concept of uh, 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 division of status will have got to be clearly kept in mind this principle is very nicely uh, uh, very nicely stated by justice k subrahmanyam in this judgment and it it would be fine if every one of you should read this judgment in total so therefore this is what is called division of status then this division of status is followed by division by meets and bounds so thereafter the parties either by consent or by the interference of the court could uh, uh, divide the properties by meets and bounds after a final decree is passed in that case and that would be division by meets and bounds there is one more important thing which one has got to keep in mind that is suppose the manager of the family expresses in his intention to divide from the joint family properties and this is communicated to all the members of the family then from the date on which he expressed his intention later he gets some money being the income from the joint family properties and with that income he purchases some new properties also then the question has arisen before the supreme court whether after the expression of intention to divide himself if he purchases some properties even with uh, the income of the joint family properties those properties will not become joint family properties so therefore if because after the division of status if the property is purchased he does not represent the family he only he has secured the money belonging to the joint and he is a trustee for the funds of the joint family only and if he purchases the properties the purchase the property purchase will not be joint family property and uh, uh, and uh, he is only ac accountable for the money that he received on behalf of the joint family so this concept of uh, uh, acquisition of properties after the division of status will have got to be clearly kept in mind while working out uh, the rights of the parties in a suit for partition now as lawyers we are generally concerned with filing suits for partition or defending in a suit for partition see when a when a client comes to us what is it we should do first the first thing that we have got to do is take a complete uh, genealogy of the family who is the prepositors who are the sons who are the daughters make a clear genealogy of the family first after making a genealogy of the family find out what is what are the dates of deaths of different members of the family in the genealogy this is very important because the law that is in force on the date of the death will have got to be applied in order to find out the shares so therefore the date of death of various members of the family has got to be noted number 2 if there are daughters who are alive or daughters who are dead note the year, date of marriage of these daughters also this is the first thing that we have got to do when a client comes to us for filing a suit for partition the next stage would be after the 
dates of deaths of the preposit whether if the prepositors died prior to 1956 act then the law that would be applicable would be hindu women's rights act 1933 that is the mysore act would be applicable and there there are certain conditions and the basic principles of that act should always be in our mind the one thing is even in the 1933 act the son grandson and great grandson they would be the heirs who would succeed to the uh, property of the uh, 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 grandfather son grandson and great grandson that, that is males in three generations in the absence of a son grandson and great grandson the property would go to the widow the daughter will not get both in the absence of the sons and the widow then only the property will go to the daughter so therefore this basic principle has got to be in mind to find out if the father has died before 1956 refer to the 1933 act and find out who would be the heirs entitled to a share in these properties then there there is also another uh, uh, clause in the 1933 act which says that the daughter by herself though entitled to a share in certain circumstances would not get a right to file a suit for partition under the 1933 act see she would be entitled to a share only at a partition and uh, therefore if a son or another male member files a suit for partition the daughter would be entitled to a share that would be that in fact these principles should always be very clearly in our mind with regard to the basics of the 33 act the the, the third and important thing is what is uh, stridhana properties is clearly defined in the 1933 act and succession to stridhana properties is different from succession to other properties so these things will have got to be kept in mind so therefore if the prepositors has died prior to the 1956 act take out the 1933 act find out how where uh, your client stands as far as the share is concerned then the next is suppose if a man dies after 1956 if a man dies after 1956 before the 2005 amendment then we have got to find out under section 6 of the hindu succession act there will be a notional partition if the prepositors dies after 1956 so therefore under you suppose there is a father two sons and two daughters the the properties or joint family properties if the father dies after 1956 and he has joint family properties then the, this prop these properties could be divided into three shares that is father and two sons the father and two sons get a one third share each and the two daughters do not get a share at the partition but they get a share only on succession to the father in respect of the one third share of the father only therefore the father's one third share will be again shared between the two sons the two daughters and the widow five people one third divided by five would be 115 share therefore the son would get a one third plus 115 share and the daughter will and the widow they get a 115 share each so therefore this concept has got to be kept in mind then this uh, uh, the the karnataka 
government, the, the state of Karnataka, for the first time, gave the status of a co-personer to a uh, daughter that is in the year 1994. So therefore, we have got to look to the provisions of the uh, 1994 Act to find out whether during that period from 1994 up to the the 2005 amendment in that period if there are daughters who, are re who have remained unmarried they would also be entitled to a share at a partition so therefore one word in this enactment will have got to be clearly kept in mind here also the word used is at a partition the copars, the female copars would be entitled to a share. The same words used in the 1933 Act, where at a partition, the daughter would be entitled to a share. Even in the 1934 Act, the word used is at a partition. According to me, the daughter, an unmarried daughter, under in the 1994 Act, she cannot independently file a suit for partition and time and share because this question has not been raised either before the High Court or the Supreme Court because how this word at a partition will have got to be looked into. So therefore, this is a moot question where we have got to apply our mind and say, even in the 1994 Act, the word used is at a partition. Therefore, the unmarried daughter, though entitled to a share, cannot enforce her right to a partition by filing a suit for partition, according to me. If there should be a partition amongst the male members of the family, she would also be entitled to a share at a partition. So therefore, the dates on which these acts have come into force, will have got to be very clearly kept in mind and uh, we should uh, uh, have those dates on our table uh, readily available so that uh, we can uh, uh, correctly assess the share to which uh, uh, the, uh, the client would be entitled to. The amendment, this uh, Hindu Succession Karnataka Amendment Act 1990. It came into force on 37, 1994. It, it has received the assent of the president and the act is not repealed by the Karnataka legislature. And therefore, it is applicable only in uh, uh, certain situations, that is, where a daughter has remained unmarried between 37, 1994 and 30 uh, and 99, 2005, then the Karnataka Act would be applicable and the unmarried daughter would be entitled to a share at a partition. So therefore, the date on which this act came into force is 37, 1994, and between 37, 1994 and 39, 19, 19, 2005, this act is still applicable, and this has got to be kept in mind. And after 9, 9, 2005, Act 39 would be applicable and not uh, uh, the Karnataka Amendment. So therefore, this then we come to the, 19, the amendment made under Act 39 bar 2005. Under this Act, a daughter is given the status of a co-pastor. The, the concept of a notional partition is given a complete go-by by the amendment in the year 2005. Therefore, the daughter, in order to have 
the benefits of the amendment of the year 2005, the Supreme Court has said in Vinita Sharma's case that a joint family must be in existence on 9-9-2005, first principle. Second thing is that the daughter should be alive on 9-9-2005. The date of birth of the daughter is absolutely irrelevant for purpose of finding out whether she is entitled to a share under the amended enactment. So therefore, if uh, the uh, in, in and if the alienation or if the property is sold by the male members of the family prior to a particular date, particular cutoff date in the year 2004, then in respect of those properties, the daughter cannot make a claim in respect of those properties and she cannot challenge the alienations. So therefore, these basic principles of law which should always be in our mind while trying to draft a plan. Then the next question is, what are the properties in respect of which we claim a partition? See, we, in, in trying to find out, the, the client gives you a number of properties which he says are joint family properties. Then you have got to get information as to how each one of the properties are uh, acquired, whether those properties are acquired by, by, the, by the father or grandfather prior to 1956 or after 1956. In fact, the Supreme Court has said in a number of cases where the property is acquired by the grandfather, we say, after 1956, and the grandfather dies uh, after 1956. In fact, in fact, what is important is the, the property is the self-acquired property of the grandfather. He might have acquired these properties prior to 1956 or subsequent to 1956. Where the grandfather dies after 1956, the Supreme Court has said that the property in the hands of his son, that is the father, would be self-acquired property in the hands of the father. So therefore, the grandson would not get a right by birth in these properties. And therefore, the grandson cannot file a suit for partition for a share in the properties acquired by his, by his father from his grandfather under Section 8 of the Hindu Succession Act. So therefore, this is a very, very important concept. Suppose, there are 10 properties which are acquired by the grandfather prior to or after 1956. If he dies after 1956, then the property in the hands of the father, all the properties in the hands of the father would be self-acquired properties. The fa if the father sells these properties, the sons or daughters, either after, before or after 2005, they cannot challenge these alienations. If any properties are left unalienated, they can claim a share from the father on succession under Section 8 of the Hindu Succession Act. So therefore, the character of the properties is what is very important. In many cases, it happens that the properties are acquired by the manager of the family or a junior member of the family or a female member of the family. In such cases, what is it that we have got to plead in the blind? If he is a manager of the family, you have got to clearly state on the date when these properties were acquired, he was the manager of the family, number one. Number two, the in, these are the uh, 
ancestral properties or joint family properties which were in his hands and the income from these joint family properties was sufficient for acquisition of the new uh, asset and therefore the manager of the family has made use of the joint family income in order to acquire these properties therefore the properties acquired in the name of the manager or joint family properties so in fact the supreme court has said in a number of cases merely showing that the joint family has large a few properties is not sufficient what is important is you have got to give evidence in regard to the income from these properties and the you will have to also take note of the fact what are the expenses Uh, uh of the joint family after defraying the expenses of the joint family something superfluous was available to the manager of the joint family for purchase of these properties and with that money he has purchased these properties therefore the law will have got to be clearly kept in mind and at the time of uh writing the plan or drafting the plan you have got to clearly say that the items 1 2 3 were joint family properties they were yielding properties there were a number of bore wells in these properties there were uh, uh, there was a grape garden on these properties this was the average annual income of the family and the family had something more than uh, left for after defraying the expenses and with that money this property is purchased though all these things need not be very explicitly pleaded at the time of giving evidence these things will have got to be clearly kept in mind so therefore where property is acquired by the manager of the family also you have got to give clear evidence of the income from the nucleus unless this clear evidence is given in regard to the income you may not ultimately succeed in respect of these properties then the second class of properties are where properties are acquired in the name of a junior member of the family in fact there are two one decision of justice e h wen e s venkatramaya in the year that is year year 1973 mysore page 113 where he has held where the lordships have held that where the property is acquired in the name of a junior member of the family the presumption is that it belongs to the junior member of the family unless evidence is adduced to show that the money for purchase of this property in the name of the junior member of the family actually flowed from joint family funds in fact in that particular case before the mysore high court there was evidence to show from the account books maintained by the joint family that the money for purchase of this property in the name of a junior member actually flowed from joint family funds so though, therefore though there is this presumption that the property purchased in the name of a junior member of the joint family is joint is a self acquired property in that case because clear evidence was available to show from the account books that the money flowed from joint family funds the property was held to be joint family property therefore in such a case you have got to clearly say how the funds were derived for the purpose of acquisition of these properties in the name of the junior member of the family number 2 that there may be cases where the senior the senior most member of the family who is normally the karta of the family he may not be well educated he may not be good in worldly affairs therefore 
in some families it is possible that it is the junior member of the family who is actually the manager of the family in such a situation special pleading would be required to show that the money from the joint family uh, nucleus was actually flowing into the hands of the junior member of the family and with this money he has purchased the asset in question and therefore that property is also joint family property then this is the second situation normally in fact i am taking note of only situations which normally arise in everyday practice the third situation where the property is acquired in the name of a female member of a family in fact the earlier uh, earlier view prior to 1956 was that this property which is acquired in the name of a female member of the family if it was possible for you to demonstrate that the property was in fact acquired with the income of the family it was also deemed to be joint family property then after introduction of the 1956 act the supreme court has held that where property is registered in the name of a female then section 14 of the hindu succession act would apply and by application of section 14 of the hindu succession act the property which is which would stands in the name of the female member would would belong to the female member only and it would not be joint family property in fact the supreme court has made a reference to it is a decision where it's a uh, case arising out of uh, uh, the Uh, uh, from karnataka where the supreme court has said you know, what happened was the property was purchased in the name of the mother in law it was a suit by a daughter in law whose husband had died against the mother in law in that case one property was acquired in the name of the mother in law the trial court had dismissed the suit in respect of that property the high court allowing the appeal held that the that the mother in law had no independent income of her own the father in law was fairly a rich man and he owned a car also therefore the high court came to the conclusion that the property is joint family property on appeal the supreme court said no by operation of section 14 of the hindu succession act where the property is acquired in the name of the uh, a female section 14 of the hindu succession act would apply and therefore uh, she would be entitled to uh, hold the property uh, as belonging to her exclusively and therefore allowed the appeal and upheld the claim of the mother in law this is a decision reported in 2009 sar civil page 728 then there is another decision of the karnataka high court in this regard that is a decision a decision reported in 2015 one karnataka law journal page 698 in this decision the karnataka high court has said to the property is acquired in the name of the female out of joint family funds the word used is out of joint family funds the property would be the exclusive property of the female and it does it is not joint family property this is what the uh, high court has said even if it is presumed that the property is acquired in the name of a female by investing the funds of the joint family 
such property becomes the absolute property of the female member and the other members of the family have no right to ask such female member uh, uh, into common hotspot and seek a partition of those properties. And the other case is, that is uh, Padmavati versus Jayama, that's also a decision of the Karnataka High Court, wherein that in that case, they, they have not made a reference to either the Karnataka decision or the Supreme Court decision. It's a bench decision of Justice Govinda Raju and uh, uh, B.V. Nagaratna. There, what happened? That she had no independent income of her own. All that she, the income that she derived was only from joint family properties. And with that joint family income, she has purchased the disputed assets. So therefore, this was the evidence given by the uh, uh, mother. So in that situation, and because the mother gave evidence practically against her own case in the written statement, she was not tendered for further cross examination. Even then, the High Court said, here was a case where the, it is admitted that the property is acquired out of joint family income by the mother herself. The mother has said that she has no income of her own. Then the court said, without reference to the de decision of the Supreme Court or the Karnataka High Court, the court said, that the property is joint family property and therefore granted a share to the plaintiff for partition of these, these, these properties. So therefore, the, these principles always must be very clearly in our mind. Otherwise, we would not be able to uh, correctly advise our clients uh, in regard to the uh, character of these properties. In fact, there is one decision of the Supreme Court, which every one of uh, uh, very practicing lawyers should read. That is AIR 2003 Supreme Court, page 3800. In fact, in this case, they have made a reference to the earlier decision in uh, Narayana Srinivasa Kanungu versus Narayana Kanungu, a very uh, famous case. That was a case where the family, the joint family owned about uh, 40 acres of land. In spite of it, the Supreme Court said, the nucleus may be 40 acres. We do not know the character of the land. We do not know the income given from these lands. Therefore, because there was no evidence of income from these lands. The court said that we cannot say that the property acquired is joint family property. Therefore, we will have to give sufficient attention at the time of evidence to say, to give an estimate of the income of the joint family. And that would be a very important consideration. Then there is section 19 of the Hindu Succession Act, which uh, many times we forget to keep in mind. In fact, I would only read section 19 and, uh, uh, and say that the principles of section 19 should always be kept in mind while uh, giving advice to our clients. This is what section 19 says. If two more or more years succeed together to the property of an interstate, they shall take the property, save as otherwise expressly provided in the act, as per capita and not per strips. Number, the second principle is very important. 
as tenants in common and not as joint tenants. This is a very important thing. So therefore, if in fact, in when I made a reference already to those uh, to a principle of law laid down by the Supreme Court, which says that where the property is acquired by a grandfather and he dies subsequent to 1956, then the property in the hands of the father would be his self-acquired property. So therefore, under section 19, class 2, the property is taken by the father, father and his brothers, as tenants in common and not as giant tenants. Therefore, it would not be joint family properties between all, between the children of the grandfather. So therefore, section 19 would apply. Therefore, in order to, uh, uh, where the property is acquired by the grandfather, it would be self-acquired property in the hands of the father. There are a number of decisions of uh, the Supreme Court and also Karnataka High Court. You may kindly make a note of these decisions. That is, yeah, yeah, 1987 Supreme Court, 558, Yudhishthir versus Ashok Kumar. Then there is one other decision, AIR, 2008 Supreme Court, 1490. Then there is a, then, then this Karnataka High Court decision, that is 2008, one Karnataka Law Journal, page 482. That was a case where the High Court had made a mistake. A review petition was allowed subsequently correcting that mistake to hold that the property in the hands of the father who acquired the property from the grandfather would be self-acquired property. Then there are other uh, uh, 2015, one Karnataka Law Journal division bench decision, page 65. Then 2016, five KCCR, page 1273. And in all these decisions, this uh, principle is upheld and uh, many times, see the normal principles is where the property is acquired by the father or grandfather, they would always be joint family properties. That was the old principle of law. This principle of law is known if the father has properties and dies after 1956, then only say, the 56 Act applies and the property would be self-acquired property in the hands of the father. But suppose the father owned self-acquired properties. He died prior to 1956. Then in such a situation, the Supreme Court has said, the, if, if he died prior to 1956, the property in the hands of the father would be joint family property and not self-acquired property. Therefore, the unless these principles are very clearly in our mind, we will not be able to draft either a proper client or defend our clients properly in certain situations where they have purchased these properties. Then there is one more important principle which we have got to keep in mind. That is, by applying, suppose, a partition takes place in the, in the family. And at a partition, properties are allotted to different persons. Then the normal situation would be, because the property is allotted to a particular person at a partition, the property in the hands of the persons to whom those properties are allotted are joint family properties. But that is not so. The Supreme, in fact, the, see, if, the, if there's a partition of the properties, the, the, the various persons who get these properties, they succeed to these properties. And therefore, they take the properties as uh, tenants in common 
and not as joint tenants and the property in their hands would be actually uh, 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 self acquired property and not joint family property in fact we will have to keep that uh, i will uh, just make a reference to that particular decision of the supreme court where this principle is stated that is i would uh, make a reference to two decisions that is one in, in har hardio rai versus shakuntala devi 2008 supreme court cases page 46 and this decision is subsequently followed by the supreme court in 2020 Yes, they are civil page one twenty seven. This is what the Supreme Court has said. Once the share of the co-partner is determined, it ceases to be co-partner property. So this is what is important. The properties in such event does not possess the the parties in such event does not possess the property. as joint tenants but as tenants in common the decision of this court in sbi therefore is not applicable to the present case where this is this please underline these words where a co-partner takes definite share in the property he is the owner of that share and as such he can alienate the same by way of sale mortgage in the same manner as he can dispose of his separate property so this is, mark this where a co-partner takes a definite share in the property he is the owner of that share and as such he can alienate the same by sale or mortgage in the same manner as he can dispose of his separate property so therefore when once there is a partition in the family and the properties are allotted to different persons see our in the normal common sense we think that these properties are joint family properties that is not so because of application of section 19 section 19 says whenever a succession takes place either by partition or inheritance whatever it may be then the persons take the property as tenants in common and not as joint tenants so therefore by applying this principle even at a partition if persons take properties the property would become self acquired property in their hands so therefore if many of these principles are applied there is very little scope for saying that a particular property is joint family property because see we are now in the year 2022 and we come across cases now only where the grandfather has passed away after 1956 because of uh, it is 66 years and only such cases normally come before court therefore if the father dies after 1956 if he has acquired properties then the properties would be self acquired properties of the grandfather it would be self acquired property in the hands of the father that would be, then the father dies the in the hands of the grandson it will also be self acquired property so therefore when once the we are able to demonstrate before the court that the properties in question are jo not joint family properties you can certainly defend you uh, get the suit for partition dismissed if the properties are not joint family properties at all and if the person who has alienated the properties uh, becomes the absolute owner of these properties so therefore the the drafting of a plain the drafting of a written statement the cross examination of the parties see first try to find out suppose there is a person who comes and says something about the income from these properties 
then you will have to find out what is the age of this person whether he is he has got any relationship with the family of uh, the parties whether he can have any personal knowledge with regard to the income whether he is himself an agriculturist whether he has some knowledge of income from agriculture lands therefore we will have to use our common sense in order to find out whether a particular conclusion could be arrived at in the case or not therefore in partition suits analyzing the facts first try to find out which is the section which applies to this case whether section 6 applies or whether if it is corporate property whether section 8 uh, applies if it is self acquired property whether section 14 would apply in case of uh, properties acquired by a female female whether section 15 applies some of the property the exclusive property of the female then under section 15 also there are two exceptions uh, created under section 15 of the, the uh, hindu succession act suppose a female has acquired properties from her father or mother side or from her husband or father in law and she dies issueless in such a situation the property does not go to the husband the property actually goes to the heirs of the father if the property is acquired by the father or mother or if the property is acquired from the husband or father in one other important thing is in order to find out who are the heirs of the father or the husband then under section 16 sub clause 3 the, uh, the property a uh, it should be imagined that the father died immediately after the female so therefore at that time who are the heirs of the father will have got to be worked out and those people would get a share in these properties therefore unless the principles of hindu law and uh, the nature of the properties the relationship the dates of death dates of uh, marriage unless all these things are kept in mind and sometimes it happens where suits are filed challenging alienations you prior to the birth of the plaintiff himself that in fact if you are able to show that the alienation was prior to the birth of uh, uh, the plaintiff then the suit will fail so therefore we have got to be very cautious in respect of these matters therefore and uh, for it therefore what i personally feel is extra care and caution is required we will have to be very patient in taking instructions from our clients in drafting either a plain or a written statement and further if we are, we even in cases i have found because the either the plaintiff's lawyer has not been very careful or the defendant's lawyer has not been very careful cases are won or lost primarily on account of uh, the fact that the lawyers have not bestowed proper attention to the law or the facts that were very essential for the case therefore i would as a lawyer with it more than 50 years of practice i have tried to gather these things Uh, from my experience and i try to share my thoughts with you therefore i think my lecture would be of some use to you and therefore thank you very much for having given me a patient here thank you all <coughs> sir dhanyavadagalu vakilarli enadru prashnegal idre kelsta illa nan mathe unmute 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 nan unmute maadkondidini sir I am not hearing you. Okay. 
ರಾಮಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಸರ್ ಏನಾದ್ರು ಕ್ವಶನ್ ಇದ್ರೆ ಕೇಳಿ ಸರ್ ಸರ್ ಮಿಸ್ಟರ್ ಸೂರ್ಯನಾರಾಯಣ ರಾವ್ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ Uh, we heard a very good lecture and it was very informative thank you very much for the same i am uh, ramaswami inga practicing in tiptur court right uh, uh, the father uh, deshikachar was a legendary advocate in uh, right. tiptur sir uh, very 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 happy very happy. Uh, we heard a very good lecture sir thank uh, we are very thankful to you for uh, enlightening us one thing that i wanted to ask was uh, so far as section 6 of the hindu succession act is concerned section 65 explanation for partition section 6 sub clause 5 sub clause 5 nothing contained in this section shall apply to a partition which has been effected before 20th day of december 2004 all right uh-huh. and the yeah uh, definition of partition that has been given and explanation is mm. for the purpose of this section partition means any partition made in execu- uh, by execution of a deed of partition duly registered under the registration act or partition effected by a decree of court right and mm. as you know that mm. so far as partition effected by a de- decree of court is concerned subsequently number of decisions have come to the effect that it should be by way of final decree right, there's right. not any sorry under quotation right, right. Ah, right. so so far as the earlier aspect is concerned that is partition mm. duly registered under the uh, registration act Do, uh, don't you think that this particular proposition has uh, complete contrary view has been taken by supreme court in minit, minit sharma's case yes sir certainly in fact i was asked to deliver a lecture on minit sharma's case uh. and i have said there that the supreme court has made a departure from the wordings of the statute yes. the supreme court has practically legislated yes. by yes. saying that even an oral partition which has been yes. acted upon yes. could yes. be recognized therefore yes. Yes. according to me also there is a departure from the wordings of the statute and the supreme yes. court has practically entered into the field of legislation by saying yes. that uh, uh, even an oral partition can be recognized so in such a case we have got number of cases like that because there is a partition the oral mm. partition yes, or yeah. by means of an unregistered property right, right. and it has been acted upon revenue mm. records have been changed etc mm. then when once this particular section is there which is quite contrary to what what is what is observed in each vinith sharma's case yeah. then yeah. what what the court should do then the court should completely we are bound by the decision of the supreme court yes we have got to follow the decision of the supreme court supreme uh, court yes uh, yes uh, and uh, we, we should not give much importance to the wordings of the statute uh, and uh, uh, even a oral partition acted upon which is uh, uh, sufficient which can be sufficiently proved by documentary evidence will have got to be honored and the yes. decision of the supreme court will have got to be followed all right that is that is one aspect sir uh-huh. another aspect is in that particular vinith sharma's case Uh-huh. no no where it has been referred to with regard to memorandum of partition or a palupatti which has been entered into which will be the usual thing yeah. they refer only to oral partition uh-huh. whether those principles will apply even in case of unregistered memorandum of partition 
hmm. is a thing that i wanted to ask you alla in fact acted upon see a partition which is not registered yes see it should always be by well, first a oral partition is always followed by a memorandum of partition no no see if a, if an oral partition is followed by a memorandum of partition or a palupatti records a previous partition generally yes. all yes. those things will have got to be honored if uh. it is capable of being proved and so it is, is admissible in evidence so according to you even memorandum of partition or unregistered palupatti it should be yes. taken note of as a, it is a oral partition yeah oral yes. partition which is subsequently recorded in a memorandum or a palupatti all right sir right. next uh, next aspect is for example let us say a female inherits the property or succeeds to the property as if she is a coparsonar she gets mm. the property mm. so far as that particular property is concerned during her lifetime whether her heirs son or daughter as the case may be whether they can file a suit for partition so far as that property is concerned if she is a coparsonar yes and if the property that was uh, acquired by her is coparsonary <laughs> property yes in my view yes her daughter or son also would get a right by birth and they by can birth. certainly file a suit they can file a suit during the lifetime of the mother yes, only certainly certainly so, uh, that, that, that that is, is uh, there is there is one they there is bench of the karnataka high court division bench of the karnataka high court last month they held no they she will get the property is an absolute uh, property and therefore the coparsonary system will not continue and her children will not get a right the uh, yes, 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 you, are, you, are, you are correct that decision uh, is there i have seen the decision <laughs> so far so so no, 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 I, i i was just saying subject to the rider in fact where the property is partitioned and she gets a share in that properties by virtue of section 19 those properties become uh, exclusive properties of that uh, of the coparsonary no no, no 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 i am not on that what ah, i say ah. is Six. as if uh, as if he is a son she hmm. gets the property we will get hmm. we will say that it is ancestral property only hmm. she gets the property as if she is a coparsonary hmm. and so far as the section 6 sub class 2 says all the property which has been succeeded to uh, which has been inherited by her as a coparsonary hmm. she holds the property with all incidents of coparsonary yes yes um, so you are um, correct in saying um, that she holds the property with all incidents of coparsonary therefore during her lifetime um, her son um, or daughter can for the enforce a suit for uh, enforce that uh, partition um, but when once that particular aspect is not there um, then uh, so far as that particular decision of her own high court says no um, no no during the lifetime of the mother it becomes her absolute property under section 14 um, therefore it cannot be uh, that, that cannot be taken into consideration at all whether which aspect of the matter is correct or not that is still a dilemma so far as i am concerned see if uh, see whatever gentleman kanu sir is sir gentleman kanu sir idya kan kan sir illa nan i have not read that decision nan yes, ye kanasta ide alla if uh, section 14 is uh, applicable and if section 14 is applied where uh-huh. property is acquired in the name of a female it becomes her exclusive property if section 14 should apply should be held to apply then it will be a exclusive property subject to reading this decision i yes. still hold that opinion that the children know, can suddenly make a yes. claim huh? yes of course I, i went through that particular decision mr basraj said yes now that is why karnataka high court karnataka high court interpret subsection 2 of section 6 mm. last mm. word mm. last word Hmm. as property capable of being disposed of by her by testamentary disposition correct correct, correct. words the high court says unless she is an absolute owner the hmm. question of disposing the property acquired by her under section 6 by testamentary disposition does not arise nice, therefore hmm. the statute itself is very clear that it is her property this is how they ah right 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 and correct oh, basraj basraj yeah, yeah. you are correct in saying that the second uh-huh. portion correct the first portion is contrary to second portion she holds the property with all incidents of coparsonary in third but further she can dispose of the property by testamentary idu antandre when earlier portion is contrary to the later portion don't you think so yes sir yes sir yes sir it it it, uh-huh. it, it, it in we will i'll have to look into the i have not read that decision in toto yeah yes uh, uh, 
therefore uh, normally if it is proportionary property in our hands yes then her children would also get a right by birth sir paragraph 20 yes, they have a right by birth general paragraph principle sir if they have a sir. right by birth then they can certainly file a suit yes sir paragraph 25 paragraph, sir let ah. me read paragraph 25 ili highlight madidini nodi sir ah thus on a ah. reading of subsection 2 of section 6 of the hindu succession act hmm. in conjunction conjunction with, ah right right <laughs> in conjunction protein it is clear yes, that any property succeeded to or devolved or derived for the benefit of a female would become her individual property and a yes. co-partnery or joint family cannot be created by or under her yes, this yes, is yes, yes. Yes. They, they, they refer to section 14 also uh, yes okay. sir conjunction right 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 correct and then uh, one more aspect that you uh, told was with regard to junior members of the family uh. of course uh, law earlier law was if, if any property is acquired by manager of the family of course the, if there is sufficient nucleus in the family it is presumed to be the joint family property mm-hmm. and the burden was upon the manager to prove that he had independent right. source of income and no portion of the joint family funds were used mm-hmm. that is that is there whether there is any distinction now uh, uh, by virtue of various case laws that you know whether there is any distinction between the property acquired by manager of the family and property acquired by junior most member of the family they 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 in the according to me is uh-huh. in fact is decisions northa hodre uh-huh. there is some slight conflict here and there yes there is some slight conflict here and there yes in in most of the cases that is uh, uh, in that uh, 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 karnataka decision which i made a reference uh, the yeah. 3800 Said they don't make a distinction between a senior member and a junior member. Junior member. They, they always say where a property is acquired in the name of any member of the joint family. Yes. Then evidence of uh, nucleus will have got to be given. Yes. Evidence of income has got to be given. Yes. If these two things are absent, then the property is a self-acquired property, even yes. if it is not. even if it is not proved by the defendant that yes. he had independent source of income yes yes that so is that what is stated so that therefore, what i have to yes uh, but therefore see generally see if uh, the manager gets the family income into his hands yes and if he has no other income of his own yes. then i think a presumption will have got to be drawn that they are joint family properties yeah. that's and my then, analysis Yes, yes, of course. Of course. And if so, he has any other independent income of his own, also, then in such a situation, the yardstick to be applied would be different. Yes. Now, so what I think is, from my little knowledge, what mm-hmm. I think is, so far as there is no distinction between the junior member of the family and the manager of the family, yes. mm-hmm. because of various decisions now mm-hmm. which are available. Because earlier the law was that that, yes. and now. one one more important aspect that i wanted to ask you was with regard to property acquired by a female hindu mm. under section 14 it becomes her absolute property right, 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 right. Mm. the same principle uh, of course she, if she acquires the property mm. and uh, so far as that particular property is concerned it is always open to the person who claims share in that particular property to prove that the female had no income of her own and also may establish that the family that the uh, that the husband or the father as the case may be had sufficient source of sufficient uh, nucleus in the family so whether the initial presumption that the property of a female hindu is a absolute property is of course available to the female so far as the person who files a suit for partition in that particular property is concerned what is the degree of proof that is required see it looks as if if the karnataka decision and yes. also that supreme court decision are looked into yes. see the it is not a presumption yes where the property is purchased in the name of a female even in fact in that karnataka decision they say that yes. even with the uh, money belonging to the joint family yes. then the property is her self acquired property and not joint family property that's what the mm. karnataka decision says yes and yes, uh, and uh, in that uh, supreme court decision also They they hold that the mother-in-law had no independent income. 
Uh, yes, the, yes. The the husband had a car and he was uh, quite yes, yes, well yes. off. Of course. The high court came to the conclusion that the property is joint family property. Yes. The Supreme Court said by application of section 14, no, it belongs to her absolutely. So Therefore, that, but, the question of presumption is not there. When but, once uh, the property is purchased in the name of a female, finished, it belongs to her. But if we if we prove that she had no independent source of income, so even then, even then, and uh, only in, in Padmavati's case where I made a reference, yes, yes, yes. They, they have not made a reference to section 14. They have not made a reference to the Supreme Court decision or the earlier Karnataka decision. They have only gone by the admissions <laughs> made by the female herself, nothing else. The law is not discussed in that case. So in my view, if it is purchased in the name of the female, finished. It belongs to her. You cannot claim it. No, so far, uh, so, so you, you mean to say that when, mm. when one say property is acquired for, by a female Hindu, mm. it is better for, to advise our clients not to file a suit for partition no. in respect of their property? Allah, in, uh, in the law, as it stands now, that mm. is the position according to me. I see. Uh, so, uh, sir, uh, the last question is, mm. uh, you just told that when once a particular property is succeeded by a person, let us say A, B and C are the sons of X. A, B and C are the sons of X. X has ancestral property and of course uh, our properties are there. And by birth, A, B and C get one third, one third, one fourth, one fourth share each, let us say. Yes. That one fourth share of A, hmm. during, when once he succeeds to that particular, he, uh, he, he gets that particular property by birth. Will it not be possible for me, uh, by the sons of A, to file a suit for partition during his lifetime? Uh, one, one thing is, so the, the situation is this, yes. where X and the three sons are there. Yes. If the grandson wants to file a suit for partition, yes. yes. If the grandson was alive, yes. When a partition took place, notion of partition yes. or whatever it is. Huh. Then only he can claim a share. If he huh. was not alive when the grandfather died, that huh. is as in Uttam's case, Uttam huh. versus Subak, huh. there the court held that the grandson was not alive when huh. the grandfather died. So, huh. at a notional partition, the three sons got a share. Therefore, yes. at the time when the father got a share, the grandson was not alive. Therefore, the suit was dismissed by the Supreme Court. Supreme Court in that case. What is the and, uh, yes, suppose yes. if a partition had taken place yes. prior to the birth of the son, yes. then the per, per son cannot file a suit at all. For but the simple might... reason, for the simple reason that when once a partition takes place, the shares given to them become self-acquired property in their hands by virtue of section 90. No, what, 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 what is the meaning of birthright then? See, but those things, see, prior to 1956, those things are there. <laughs> but by interpretation, yes, by interpretation, yes. there is no giant family property, that there is no okay. giant family. <laughs> so, in such a case, the Supreme Court has diluted the law, according to me. Yes, of course. Uh, there there have been a lot of confusion with regard uh, to this. Sir, there is a lot of confusion. Just, yes. Sir, yes. Justice Narayan, Justice Rowington Nariman in Uttam case has held that where the father gets the ancestral property in a partition hmm. and he sells the property, then if a son is born subsequently, the giant family will not revive and the sale made by the father is valid provided the partition takes place along with the sisters. This is no, all. But the sub no, subsequent no. judgment of the Supreme Court, subsequent judgment of the Supreme Court, Justice Nazir has held, he has clarified without reference to Uttam that if a son is born subsequently, then the giant family revives and the son will get a share. This is what no, subsequently no, the, the judgment no, after Uttam. After Uttam, this is the law declared. Allah, Uttam's case yes, was not a case of challenging the alienation according to me, Mr. Yes. Basar. That was a case, that was a case, it was a simple suit for partition by a grandson. The grandfather, the grandfather died before the plaintiff grandson was born. Therefore, the court held 
that at the time when this notional partition took place the grandson was not alive therefore he would not get a right in these properties by the operation of in conjoint reading of section 6 8 and 19 that is what is stated in uthams case so therefore they held because he was that was not a question of challenging the alienation according to me it was a simple suit for partition by a grandson against his father is <laughs> alright anyway of course a uh, lot of confusion is there as you rightly put it hmm. and yeah, even in vinita sharma's case sir yes, they yes. say that uh, no i uh, notional partition or division of status hmm. yes and uh, uh, my uh, it has got a far reaching effect now because of because in all cases there will be like that uh, only Uh, trying to find out the share of the deceased on the date of his death. Uh, yes, yes, yes. The entire shares will have got to be worked out uh, at the time of uh, final years, which required to be still answered by the Supreme Court itself. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Sriya Kant, sir. So, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for your enlightening lecture. Thank you. Sir, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, I will share the judgment of uh, Justice Nazir. Ah, please. Ah, right, right. Ah, Nazir, so I mean, Govind Raj, Justice Govind Raj, judgment. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Both, both, both. The, see, and I get see one thing. I wanted to, um, you know, with the Mr. This is the debate of two stalwarts today, Mr. Suranarendra and Mr. Ramsam Yengar. This is our greatest opportunity to listen to the two great persons who have. uh we, we have got so much uh, wealth of knowledge on uh, civil law especially hindu law ivaga enagide one one enagide ant helidre when a client comes to file a suit for partition or any suit for that matter idam ittam anta helik agodilla nodi one 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 udharane kodtini nodi one udharane kodtini immediately after the judgment of the supreme court in uh, prakash versus pulwati the when the father died before 2005 many advocates said don't file the suit because I this know. is the law some trial court advocate they said eh angala baradilla even if the father died earlier doesn't matter it's a property don't worry until they file the suit now after the judgment of vinita sharma all those uh, advocates who read the law they look <laughs> they are considered stupid then those advocates nan helnilva nimige share baruthe anta yardo maat kelkond hakilla nodu share banta illu so they don't they don't go by law okay. they go by common sense and unfortunately the the vinith prakash versus pulwati is overruled by vinitha sharma and the advocate who uh, advised them to file the suit now he is considered as a genius sir, and, so, please and, think and, sir five different judges of the supreme court understand the same section differently and there what yes. about us Five yes, judges, the Supreme Court, oh, they yeah. understand the same section differently. Okay, What okay. is our position? Okay. And, to is, say, okay. and to say that daughter of a co-partner means the co-partner should be alive. Okay. Such a hmm. literal interpretation led to the manne thane matar thay. Sir, see what happened today is earlier 1894 Act agli start transfer of property agli there would be statutory illustrations and explanations. For example, A sells the horse to B, and all that yeah, statute yeah. illustrate. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, illustration illa. Most of the sections are like Sanskrit slokas. Exactly. Nobody can understand. understand. And the correct <laughs> legal position will emerge after 15 years. By the time yeah. there will be complete damage yeah. to the chaos. Complete chaos. chaos. Right. There must be statutory illustrations which would were given earlier. Evidence Act till lastly, sale of goods till lastly, every section will have a statutory illustration. Ah, you explain. Ah, what are you calling it? Vaga. Sumna okay. section or visa ki ame ame le during even during the pendency of Prakash Pulwati versus Pulwati some clarification in note some proviso would have saved uh, hundreds and hundred thousands of cases. This is the problem with the legislators. Okay. Anyway, ame le you know sir decree and the parodro why not say preliminary degree or final <laughs> degree? See this the statute could have made things very clear. Correct, correct. This, see, at the time yes, of drafting a statute, yes, uh, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. But sir, the trial court lawyers now associate more with sir. Appellate lawyers' difficulty is what I call it. Actually, no, no, no. Now, 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 now,
ನಮಗೆ ತುಂಬಾ ಕನ್ಫ್ಯೂಷನ್ ಟು ಬಿಲ್ಡ್ ಅ ಕೇಸ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಟ್ರಯಲ್ ಕೋರ್ಟ್ ಇಸ್ ರಿಯಲಿ ಡಿಫಿಕಲ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಪೆಷಲ್ ಪ್ಲೀಡಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಎವಿಡೆನ್ಸ್ ಎಷ್ಟು ಕಷ್ಟ ಇರುತ್ತೆ ಆಕ್ಚುಯಲ್ ಆಗಿ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ರಾಜ್ಯ ವಕೀಲರ ಪರಿಷತ್ತು ಮತ್ತು ಕೆಎಸ್ ಬಿ ಸಿ ಲಾ ಅಕಾಡೆಮಿ ಅವರು ಇವರು ನಡೆಸಿಕೊಡುತ್ತಿರುವ ಅಂತರ್ಜಾಲ ಕಾರ್ಯಾಗಾರದ ಕೊನೆಯ ದಿವಸದ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮದಲ್ಲಿ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸ ನೀಡಿದಂತ ಶ್ರೀ ಸೂರ್ಯನಾರಾಯಣ ಅವ್ರಿಗೂ ಮತ್ತು ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸದಲ್ಲಿ ಭಾಗವಹಿಸಿ ತಮ್ಮ ಅಮೂಲ್ಯವಾದ ಜ್ಞಾನವನ್ನ ನಮ್ಮ ಜೊತೆಗೆ ಹಂಚಿಕೊಂಡಂತಹ ಪ್ರಖ್ಯಾತ ವಕೀಲರಾದ ಶ್ರೀ ರಾಮಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಅವರಿಗೂ ಕೂಡ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ರಾಜ್ಯ ವಕೀಲರ ಪರಿಷತ್ತು ಮತ್ತು ಕೆಎಸ್ ಬಿ ಸಿ ಲಾ ಅಕಾಡೆಮಿ ಪರವಾಗಿ ಧನ್ಯವಾದಗಳನ್ನು ಅರ್ಪಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ ಈಗ ತಿಪಟೂರು ವಕೀಲರ ಸಂಘದ ಅಧ್ಯಕ್ಷರಾದ ಶ್ರೀ ಉಮೇಶ್ ಅವರಿಗೆ ವಂದನಾರ್ಪಣೆ ಮಾಡ್ಬೇಕಂತ ಕೇಳ್ಕೊತೀನಿ ಅದು ಅನ್ಮ್ಯೂಟ್ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಳ್ಳಿ ಉಮೇಶ್ ಅವರೇ ಹಲೋ ಕೇಳಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಹೇಳಿ ಸರ್ ನಿಜವಾಗ್ಲೂ ಈ ದಿನದ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮ ತುಂಬಾ ಉತ್ತಮವಾಗಿತ್ತು ನಿಜವಾಗ್ಲೂ ಈ ಮೂರ್ ದಿವಸದ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮದಲ್ಲಿ ಈ ದಿನ ಇವತ್ತು ನಿನ್ನೆ ಅಂತರ್ಜಾಲದ ಮುಖಾಂತರ ನಮ್ಮ ತಿಪ್ಪೂರು ವಕೀಲರ ಸಂಘಕ್ಕೆ ಮತ್ತು ಎಲ್ಲ ಮಿತ್ರರಿಗೆ ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಒಂದು ಉತ್ತಮವಾದ ಒಂದು ಜ್ಞಾನಾರ್ಜನೆಯನ್ನು ತಾವು ಹೊಸ್ಕೊಟ್ಟಿದೀರಾ ನಿಜವಾಗ್ಲೂ ನಮ್ಮ ಎಲ್ಲ ವಕೀಲರ ಪರವಾಗಿ ನಮ್ಮ ವಕೀಲರ ಸಂಘದ ಪರವಾಗಿ ನಿಮಗೆ ವಂದನೆಗಳನ್ನು ಸಲ್ಲಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ ನಿಜವಾಗ್ಲೂ ಇದು ಅದ್ಭುತವಾದ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮ ಸರ್ ಇದು ನಮಗೆ ಇನ್ಫ್ರಾಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಚರ್ ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ಕಡಿಮೆ ಆದ್ರು ಮುಂದಿನ ದಿನಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ಇದನ್ನ ಇನ್ನೂ ಉತ್ತಮ ರೀತಿಯಾಗಿ ಅಳವಡಿಸ್ಕೊಂಡು ಇನ್ನೂ ಉತ್ತಮವಾದಂತ ವರ್ಕ್ ವರ್ಕ್ ಶಾಪ್ ನ ನಡೆಸುವುದಕ್ಕೆ ನಾವು ಎಲ್ಲ ವಕೀಲ ಮಿತ್ರರು ಸೇರಿ ಪ್ರಯತ್ನ ಮಾಡ್ತೀವಿ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿ ಈ ದಿನ ಆ ಸೂರ್ಯನಾರಾಯಣ ರಾವ್ ಅವರು ಸೀನಿಯರ್ ವಕೀಲ್ ಚಿಕ್ಕಬಳ್ಳಾಪುರದವರು ಇಂದುಲಾ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ತುಂಬಾ ಚೆನ್ನಾಗಿ ತಿಳಿಸ್ಕೊಟ್ಟಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅವರು ಸಹ ನಾನು ನಮ್ಮ ವಕೀಲ ಸಂಘದ ಪರವಾಗಿ ಧನ್ಯವಾದಗಳನ್ನ ಅರ್ಪಿಸಿ ಈ ಆಮ ವಕೀಲ ಪಕ್ಷ ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ಸೇರಿ ನಾನು ಈ ದಿನ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮವನ್ನು ಮುಕ್ತಾಯ ಮಾಡಿಸ್ಕೊಡೋದಕ್ಕೆ ಧನ್ಯವಾದಗಳನ್ನ ಅರ್ಪಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ ಸರ್ ಆಮೇಲೆ ವಿಶೇಷವಾಗಿ ಬಸವರಾಜ್ ಸರ್ ನಿಮಗೂ ಸಹ ಈ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮಕ್ಕೆ ತುಂಬಾ ನಮಗೆ ಅನುಕೂಲ ಮಾಡಿಕೊಡ್ರಿ ನಿಜವಾಗ್ಲೂ ನಮ್ಮ ವಕೀಲ ಸಂಘದ ಪರವಾಗಿ ನಿಮಗೆ ವಿಶೇಷವಾದ ಧನ್ಯವಾದಗಳನ್ನು ಈ ಸಂಬಂಧ ಅರ್ಪಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ ಅದೇ ರೀತಿ ಕೆ ಎಸ್ ರಾಮಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಹೆಂಗಾರರು ಈ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸದಲ್ಲಿ ಭಾಗವಹಿಸಿ ಆ ತುಂಬಾ ಇಂಟ್ರಾಕ್ಷನ್ ಮುಖಾಂತರ ನಮ್ಮ ಮಾಹಿತಿಯನ್ನು ಒದಿಸ್ಕೊಟ್ಟಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅವ್ರಿಗೂ ಸಹ ನಾವು ಧನ್ಯವಾದಗಳನ್ನು ಅರ್ಪಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ ಸರ್ ಆಮೇಲೆ ಬಾರ್ ಕೌನ್ಸಿಲ್ ಮೆಂಬರ್ಸ್ 